And what you do in order to drive efficiency, you try to balance different segments and you try to level the ROAS across everything because that's the best use of your money if you want to drive revenue. But if you go one level down and you take a look at the actual margins of these products, um, things might not be balanced. You see an ROI in one segment which is higher than in the other. So there are inefficiencies and you can, could alloc reallocate your budget in a smarter way to drive more margin. And then you can go one step further, you can take into account what these customers you bring in will do over time. So if I go back, um, let's say one year, analyze my performance, I might see a leveled ROAS, but an unleveled ROI, and even worse, long-term value of the customers is totally different. So this shows that what looked efficient isn't necessarily efficient. And um, this is the change we are currently um, experiencing, and there are lots of companies now being aware of exactly this. The major problem we encounter is um, organizations tend to not change, and this is what needs to be done. Yeah. Well, I, I can I can retire right now. I mean, that's it, because because it is really it is exactly this situation that I've been pointing to and and you know yelling about and and begging companies to change for uh, 20 years, uh, and too often they say yeah, but. And you know you can all fill in the rest, but to actually see it and do something about it, uh, and then to get clients to do so as well, you know whether it's involving my work or not, that that's irrelevant. It's just doing the right thing, doing what the data really tells you, instead of doing it because that's the way that you know your boss did it when when he was in the role. That, that's that's really smart. Yeah, um, what we like to say is companies tend to run fast, but not necessarily into the right direction, and this is what needs to be uh -huh. changed. Right. Um, how we structured um, this Q&A is um, I'd like to start very top down um, and um, you did some work on um, corporate um, valuation um, methods and um, I think it's interesting because this is um, changing um, the entire space currently and then let's go down one level, take a look at marketing use cases and then we have Mariana who can ask the really smart questions. Um, I'm going to leave them to her. Um, so. In the past, apparently, um, corporate valuation um, worked um, in a um, non-ideal way. Um, what is, uh, how did um, PE companies, um, venture capitalists, or public markets value businesses, and what's, what was wrong with that? Sure, so it's, it's all based on, on revenues. Uh, and so let's just look at overall aggregate revenue, and then come up with some multiple. I don't need to tell you all this. Um, let's come up with the appropriate multiple that, that we use in our sector or that other companies like ours have, have used in the past. So there's revenue, let's multiply it by four, and boom, that's the value of the company. And that's the way it works. But that really is ridiculous. And so our point is that revenue isn't a thing. <laughs> that revenue is the outcome of a bunch of different things. And if we can, under, if we can understand and forecast each of those next level down components, the things that add up to revenue, we will do a better job of, well, so what are those things? How many customers are we going to acquire? How long will they continue to maintain a relationship with us? How many transactions will they make over that horizon? And how much margin are we making on each of those transactions? Right? Each one of those four things makes a lot of sense. It's kind of interesting and operational by itself. But when you bring them all together to say that not all dollars are created equal, don't just tell me what your revenue is or how much it's grown, but tell me why. Tell me about these underlying factors. That's where all the insight occurs. Uh, and then if we can project each of those things into the future, and by the way, it's far easier to project each of those components very far than it is to project revenue. Because again, those are the organic pieces that just add up to revenue. So if we can just look at, at, at the unit economics, if we can just look at these kind of marketing metrics, forecast those things out instead, then we don't need to play the multiple game. Then we can basically project very accurately how much revenue will be there and, and, and what will the trajectory of it look like uh, over the years to come. And we'll tend to get more accurate valuations. We'll tend to get ones that are more actionable because now we understand why revenues are, are growing or shrinking. We can make better comparisons across companies. So it just, it just dominates. But still, this revolution is just beginning. There's a long way to go. 
Yeah, and um, it, I think it was just today that Casper um, went public, and their share price was at the lower range, I think it was 12, and one of your um, colleagues, um, Dan McCarthy, um, he already um, researched a little bit, and um, what, what was his take on this IPO? Yeah, so, so this has been a lot of fun for us, e even though uh, in, kind of in the business and academic side, I don't really do anything with IPOs, but when a company announces its IPO, you know, before it actually goes public, they put their S1 filing out there. And very often, they put some really rich data out there, sometimes numbers that they learn to regret. <laughs> so it, it used to be that when they put them out there, it's like, hey, we have data. They didn't really think that anyone could reverse engineer it. The very first one that, that we did, uh, that, that Dan did, actually, was with Blue Apron which we all know is kind of an unmitigated disaster in the four years since its IPO. But at the time, if we go back to you know, the, 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 the days that they announced it, this was kind of golden. It was a rocket ship. We, we just can't remember that. You know, hindsight's very strong. But because they gave us the right metrics, we were able to see right through it. And they could talk whatever they want about revenue, but we could tell that the retention rates were really low and getting lower. The customer acquisition costs were high and getting higher. It was a, com a company that was completely out of whack despite the fact that at that time it looked good. The good news is that people are bringing so much more scrutiny to these IPOs. We'll take a little bit of credit for it, a little bit. Um, we kind of do it a little bit more rigorously than anyone else, but when Casper announced its IPO right away, a lot of people, not just Dan, were questioning the unit economics there. And to see the kind of impact that it had, to see them kind of lower their, their, their IPO. Now, I don't know exactly what happened, but I was sort of looking at it, and I heard that it actually popped pretty well. It actually did pretty well today relative to that, that $12 benchmark. So I think there's still a bunch of people out there who either don't believe this way of looking at things or think that there's some aspects of the company that our models aren't picking up. Who, who knows? And, and only time will tell. Um, so, so in the Casper case, we didn't have quite enough data to, to fully reverse engineer it. Uh, but we've done so with, with a lot of other companies. And it's, and it's without having any stakes in it. I'm not making any stock picks. And I'm a marketing professor. You shouldn't listen to me anyway. Um, but, uh, but just to tell people that they should be looking a little bit more rigorously. And to the companies themselves, that whether they disclose or not, they should be at least be internally looking at, at a different set of metrics in a different set of ways instead of just, you know, same store sales or some of the traditional old metrics. Um, you, you did something quite similar for Wayfair, um, and when you published your insights, the stock price went down immediately, so it was quite a heavy impact. Um, if we look at the stock price today, it's actually much higher than it was um, when you published your paper. Uh -huh. um, question is, um, were you wrong, or is the, are the public it. markets <laughs> irrational? I love it, I love it, I love it. The Wafer one is the <laughs> ultimate Rorschach test of this stuff. So actually, let me, let me work my way to Wafer, because that is the, the weirdest and most interesting one. With most companies, uh, especially, let's put aside the IPOs, but publicly traded companies that happen to reveal a good amount of data. So the first paper we wrote, we looked at a Dish Network and Sirius XM satellite radio. It was all published. So it's a paper we published in 2017, doing an analysis through 2015. And basically what we said at the time was that Dish was overvalued and Sirius was undervalued. And if you look at their stock prices today, we were exactly right. Now, one went up, well, one went down, the other went up. Um, uh, and so for most of the time, again, for, for established publicly traded companies that do reveal enough data, um, we, uh, and we're not doing any magic, but just by looking at data the right way, by decomposing it down to the right level, everything I said, uh, it, it just kind of makes sense. And, and the vast majority of the time, the company will end up moving in the direction, the, the, you know, the deviation that we, we saw from, from the market valuation. Uh, and, and Wayfair is an exception to that. So, uh, so we did the Wayfair analysis. We said that the company's worth $10 a share. Uh, and we're right about that. And we actually redid the analysis a year and a half later and found out that the company at that time, year and a half later, summer of 2018, was worth $10 a share. <laughs> so it's very consistent that all of their metrics that I described are right on target with, with what we said. Yet they closed today at about $100 a share. <laughs> so, uh, so on one hand, <laughs> Well, I, I don't really know. But if you look at the, the graph of their stock price, I just looked at it. The day we posted the paper, 
Okay, so we took this paper and put it out there on some nerdy website. Uh, and that day, the company was trading for about $85 a share. Um, and it, again, it was like a rocket ship. That was September of 2017. So here we are almost two and a half years later, and now it's at 100. So it's gone up like you know 10% in two and a half years in a big giant bull market. So on one hand, you could say, we were wrong. It went up when we said it will be going down. On the other hand, you could say, it really hasn't moved much at all when every other company has been, been going up a lot. And the last thing I'll say on it, and I don't want to sound defensive, because I, I don't know. I, you know I'm, again, I'm, I'm, um, in that analysis, we said the company will crash. That, that basically they're acquiring too many customers too quickly, paying too much to get them, and they're not staying around and, and repeat buying. But we didn't say the crash is going to occur right away. <laughs> In fact, our, our modal estimate is that that crash will occur sometime around 2024. So, so there is still a bit of runway there, but until they kind of change their ways, it's not looking real good. But, but still, uh, it, you, you, can, you can read it and draw your own conclusions, and that's what it's all about, is having a, a good discussion about it. I think conceptually the approach is quite clear. Could you um, outline a little bit how such a project where you do this sort of um, customer-based valuation works in practice? Sure. Yeah, so again, it's, it's important to point out that most of the time we're working with private companies. So in the, again, in the case of an IPO, it's very limited S1 data. In the case of a Wayfair, it happens to be information that they're putting out in their quarterly filings. And by the way, I'm immensely impressed that they do that and, and, and very grateful that they do. So people think I'm a Wayfair hater. I actually, I admire them for doing so, even if the market might be overvaluing them. It's not necessarily their fault. Um, so in most cases, we're working, uh, say, with a private equity firm or directly with a corporate that feels that they're grossly undervalued, that there's lots of customer loyalty and stickiness and the market doesn't really see it. So we'll basically take the transaction log data and they'll predict the four things that I said. How many customers will we acquire? How long will they stay? How many purchases will they make? How much will they spend when they do? Add all that stuff up and, and basically say, what's it worth? And then one other wrinkle that we add, and it's very, very, very important, I heard Dave talking about it earlier, is that we're not just going to do this for the customers as a whole. We're going to do it on a cohort by cohort basis. It's really, really important to recognize that not only is there tremendous customer heterogeneity for a given group of customers that we acquire, but over time, the next tranche of customers we acquire will be a different mix than the previous one. So it's very important to capture those cross-cohort dynamics as well. So very often, if we're working with a, with a PE firm, we'll say, this company looks great, but the cohorts are getting worse over time. They're basically either oversaturating the market and they can't find those good customers, or they're getting arrogant about it and they're not spending as much on acquisition as they used to. I, I don't know. I don't know. But seeing those cross-cohort dynamics, that's in some sense, that's, that's, I don't want to call it secret sauce. I just told you. <laughs> and the methods are all out there. Um, but that's kind of a, a, a key step to recognize not only the, the heterogeneity within a group of customers, but how the mix is changing over time. And I can go on for days about that and won't. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about, about your book, um, Customer Centricity. Um, you said something that this traditional approach of audience targeting and persona development is an archaic approach. Mm -hmm. um, what's wrong with this if everyone is doing it? Everyone's doing it for the wrong reason. Everyone's doing it because their grandfather did it. Uh, you know, back in the old days, back in the Mad Men era, you know, all we had were aggregate sales and demographics. And so we would kind of make the most out of the day that we had. I can't really blame people for doing it back then. But we've come so far. And you look at the kind of data that you know, all of your companies have. And I'd like to believe that most of your companies are doing good things with it. That's why you're here. You know, you're a very select set. Um, yet old habits die hard. Uh, and there's a lot of companies that just, just cling to these notions. Plus, not to say you guys, but let's also blame the agencies too. Uh, because very often the clients are just listening to them. Uh, and the agencies, they, they, everyone loves the persona thing. Everyone loves personas, right? So if we're working with some you know, women's accessory company, there's going to be Carpool Carla and Working Wanda and Busy Betty. And, and we find that stuff really, really, really appealing, right? We can relate to it. It sells. But it's also, it's, it's also kind of insulting. It, it's kind of, a, it, it's, it's stereotyping. And it's kind of putting customers in buckets 
that aren't necessarily borne out by the data. And even if the personas are driven by data instead of intuition, even then, it's suggesting that the range of differences across the customer base is very narrow and can be captured so simply. So, so you know, demographics, personas, there was a time for them. I wouldn't reject them completely, but we shouldn't be leading with them. We should be leading with customer lifetime value and then layering the demographics on top of that to try to understand what makes the high value customers different than the low value ones. And if we see some de demographics or persona profiles that pop, fine, let's exploit them. But let's not start with that stuff. Today, everyone, everybody seems to talk about customer centricity, but few companies have actually implemented such an approach. Do you have examples of companies which truly follow um, this um, methodology and um, have implemented it, and what does it look like? Yeah, so, so first we have to be clear on what it is. And, and for those of you um, who haven't had the, the, the misfortune of, of reading my books, um, you know, those words, it was, a, I'm saying this very honestly, it was a very bad choice of words. It was a bad title to choose for the first book because people get the wrong idea. Because there's a lot of people who say, well, yeah, we're customer-centric. <laughs> we're centered around the customer. No, no, there is no the customer. Um, so the idea that not all customers are created equal and that there's vast differences across them. I mean, they're tremendously different from each other. Um, and that... Uh, and that the, the, the pattern of how they differ is, is remarkably regular. It's remarkably predictable. And I could, I could wave my magic wand over the customers in each of your companies, and I could tell you right now what the distribution of CLVs would look like. So there's tremendous regularity across it. Um, so first we have to appreciate these differences, that they exist, that there's some predictability to it, and then there's some actionability to it. And if we could figure out who those... Because the subtitle of the book is useful. It's customer centricity. Blah. Ramsey, what's the subtitle? Uh, focus on the right customer. Good enough. <laughs> Ramsey's one of my students. He keeps hearing me say this every day. Focus on the right customers for a strategic advantage. Okay? That, that if instead of aiming to the middle for that average customer, if we could figure out that spike on the right, those customers with the really high CLV, like what is it about them? How are they using our product? What else can we develop with them in mind? How do we acquire more customers like them? What are the kinds of things that these guys are doing uh, that we can make more money in a sustainable, defendable way than just kind of aiming down the middle and saying, huh, will this product sell broadly? No, it's will this product appeal to those customers over there? So that's what customer centricity is all about. It's the recognition of these differences, celebration of those differences, and then a call to action to take advantage of it, to really leverage those differences and kind of pivot, not just the analytics, not just the product development, but the entire corporation. It's all about a cultural mindset to say that, that we're not just about the product anymore. The product is something that we come up with to help us squeeze more value out of those high value customers. Uh, and so, so that's the hard part, is getting companies to, not just to say, okay, we'll try the CLV thing, sure, all the cool kids are doing it, um, but it, it's something that, that's more fundamental and, and kind of higher level than that. Um, and so some, some companies are getting it. So one of the companies I love to talk about is Electronic Arts, the gaming company. A company that was, not, unlike some of, of your you know, younger companies, a company that wasn't born into it, a company that for you know, decades was selling shrink-wrapped discs to you know, Walmart or GameStop or whoever with no visibility into who was buying it, but then basically said, enough is enough. We need to change our business model. We need to change our corporate emphasis. We need to tra tag and track individual customers. We need to understand their lifetime value. We need to constantly update it. So every single day, they look at a billion customers around the world and say, how much more valuable are they today than they were yesterday? And then to use that as the basis to drive strategy and evaluate the tactics that, that they're using. So I love EA. And I can talk about a lot of other companies as well. And I gotta say, again, just met Dave for the first time over here, but, but it sounds like uh, Foot Locker is doing very much the same kinds of things. And again, it's more than just having a bunch of technical skills. It's having you know, broad enterprise-wide buy-in on it. 
one typical obstacle we see is that companies are pressured to grow, and usually growth is defined by revenue growth. So um, whenever we pitch and we give advice and um, tell companies, hey, don't look too much at revenue, it's all about um, customer lifetime value, what we hear is, yeah, but then um, our revenue will go down. And what we say is, yeah, of course, because you're trading something more valuable, you sacrifice some revenue, but you get more margin in. Um, but how realistic is it to implement such a strategy um, as long as the public markets value companies based on other KPIs? I can't tell you how many times I've dealt with this same frustration. That, look, I'm a marketing professor. I'm working on marketing analytics and tactics. I'm working my way up through the marketing funnel, and then eventually, maybe, if I'm lucky, I'll win over the CMO, right? And that's great. But then, you know, she'll turn to the other C-level people, and they'll go, come on, come on, really? Um, and, 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 the, and things stop there. And honestly, between us, turn the recording off. No, uh, between us, that's the main reason I turn to, uh, to customer-based corporate valuation. That I'm not a finance guy. I'm not starting a hedge fund on this stuff. I just want to win over the company. And I've realized that the best way to win over the CMO is to win over the CFO first. So if I can go to the CFO, and say, I got something for you. You know, corporate valuation matters, right? Don't you want to understand what that number is and why it's that way and how it's changing and how it would change under different circumstances? Yeah, 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 yeah. If I can win over the CFO using the exact same models that we're using for marketing purposes, and then the CFO will say, hey, CMO, you want to check this out? It's going to be so much easier to, to not only win over the marketing people, but to win over the entire organization. So kind of what I've been doing is like really sneaky, is I've been trying to, to, to kind of use this sort of flanker strategy. Let me work my way up through marketing. That's the standard day job stuff that I do. Let me work on the CFO through customer-based corporate valuation. And let me talk about some of this, you know, big picture, high level stuff, the customer centricity, enterprise-wide strategy, you know, through the books that I write and all that. So if I can get each of them, or at least two of them on board, with different tactics, different approaches, it's going to make it much easier to get the third and to get everybody else in the company on board. Now, again, it's very hard for me to, to sit back and, and declare victory, but the fact that I'm being rejected much less often than it was before, and people are at least listening, and different people within the organization are at least giving it a try, it means that we really are on, on the verge of, of, of something great. Uh, and it's been remarkable uh, how much progress we've seen uh, just in, in the last couple of years, and, and since, I, since I wrote that first book, and I'll take only a tiny bit of credit for it. In many cases, this company is waking up on their own and saying, this is what we need. Um, but it's, uh, but, but w w these are good times, uh, and, and I think these next five or ten years are going to really be pivotal for, for every one of those folks within the organization. Let's assume we have um, probabilistic models, machine learning models, and we are very good at predicting the customer lifetime value of our customer base. What can we do with that now? How can we use this in practice beyond just um, the corporate valuation? Yeah, and that, and that, was, that was the whole, uh, so again, the, the, my previous startup, Zodiac, that was the whole proposition there, is that the lifetime value stuff, we're just going to give you that. that that's going to be easy, okay? But here's the 50 fun things to do with it. A lot of things that I've been laying out in the books, so let's, let's be smart about customer acquisition, let's think very carefully about all the different acquisition tactics we use, and understand which ones we're going to use when and how much we should spend on them and how to evaluate the ROI of them. Customer retention and development. You know, everybody's out there doing the NPS thing, and I got nothing against it, by the way. But as we, we go out there, you know, we're, we're going to take our company and drive it to NPS 50, right? We want to get an NPS of plus 50. Well, that's great, but what's the actual impact of it? So let's look at it through the lens of lifetime value as well to come up with the, the financial value of, of those kinds of initiatives. So again, whether it's customer experience or acquisition, retention development, and, and then all the way through things like customer-based corporate valuation, and then having it trickle up the supply chain and maybe even through talent management. So maybe we can judge our employees by how much additional lifetime value, you know, there's a lot of clienteling that will go on with retailers. Um, let's, let's, you know, let's put some CLV on that as well. So as far as I'm concerned, and, and maybe I'm overdoing it, uh, I think almost every aspect of the organization can be driven or judged by lifetime value. And I really believe that a lot of companies are overspending on retention or even 
dare I say it, dare I say it, customer experience. As every retailer is out there doing their big giant CX campaign, and I'm saying you got to judge that based on the lifetime value. Tell me about the value of the customers who participated in it and how much their lifetime value changed. Uh, and in many cases, you're going to see that, you know what, it wasn't really that good. Maybe we sold a bunch of stuff, but we sold it to a bunch of not so great customers who, you know, didn't buy from us before and aren't going to buy from us after. So, so part of it is going to be uh, elevating spend in certain areas, acquisition, maybe rationalizing spend in other areas, uh, and then some of these other far out applications involving, you know, outside of marketing. Um, let me share um, an awkward conversation I recently had because it's um, just um, related to what you what you mentioned. Um, I talked to someone and he said, "Hey, look, it's it's not about bringing these customers in in the first place. The second purchase is what matters. If they buy a second time, then they are great customers." So my question is. Do we acquire good customers or do we make good customers? And there is no doubt about it. It is the former. And by the way, and I agree with that premise. It's that second purchase that kind of makes or breaks the relationship. But the problem is that was set in stone before the first purchase was made. And so we can use the second purchase uh, as just a guide of did we do a good job at acquisition? But the, you know, at that point, it's too late. It's good to know, but, but um, yeah, so that, look. You all know this phrase, right? It costs, pick the number, X times more to acquire a customer than to retain one. So you really got to focus on the customers you have. Right? You all know that phrase. I'm seeing the heads going up and down, right? What, what's, what's my take on that phrase? Is it true? It's like a trick question here. <laughs> Turns out it, it is true. Of course it's true. Of course it's going to be more expensive to acquire than to retain. But what's my take on it? And my take on it is this. Stop being such a friggin' cheapskate. Don't run your business, don't run your customer base on the basis of cost. Run and evaluate your customer base on the basis of, say it with me, value, value, right? So just because we might be taking on higher cost to acquire that potentially good new one versus bribing that so-so one to stay with us for an extra year, do it! <laughs> Invest in the right kinds of customers. So many companies either don't believe that or they're, they're kind of brainwashed or forced by senior management. Um, you, 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 we, can't, we can't sleep at night until every customer is happy. Uh, and that's, it, that sounds nice. It's romantic, but it's wrong. Can I tell you one story? I'm going to tell you a story over here. Okay. So, uh, so yeah, I, was, I gave a talk at, 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 at the Bain NPS Forum a couple years ago. And, and there I'm giving my same shtick. So you know what's my take on that promoter score? You got your promoters, you got your detractors. What should you do? What should you do? You got two choices. We can either clone the promoters or we could turn the detractors into promoters. Obviously, we'd like to achieve both. But if we have incremental dollar to spend, which one are we going to try to spend it on? Clone the promoters, right? Learn to live with the detractors. So I say all this stuff, blah, 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 blah. And then sitting right in front of me is the most powerful woman in the retail world, Angela Arons, you know, who used to run Apple retail. And Angela says, Professor Fader, with all due respect, that's not how we do it at Apple. And you can see all these people have been writing down everything I was saying all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> Angela says, at Apple, it's very important for us to turn those detractors into promoters. Am I going to do whatever it takes to do so? And I'm thinking, shit, I've lost the room. <laughs> what am I going to do? <laughs> so I say, with all due respect, Angela, you work for a company named Apple. You are the only company on the planet, or at least in this country, that will have people lining up around the block to buy something before they even know what it is. The rest of you, listen to me. <laughs> The rest of you are going to have detractors, and it's not your fault. Don't take it personally. When you go out there and acquire customers, no matter how smart you are, no matter how good you get at acquisition, a lot of the customers, most of the customers you acquire are going to be, eh, so-so. Learn to live with that. It, it is not a personal failing. <laughs> if we can just nudge that the percent of good customers up by a little bit, even if we can't get it to 50%, We've done a good job. And the fact is that those great customers are a thousand times more valuable than the so-so ones, so it doesn't really take a lot of them 
for our acquisition efforts to look good. Um, so, so, yeah, we've got to learn to live with the detractors and learn to kind of take these kinds of, of, of statements and put them in the proper context, put the data up against them, and show people that ultimately, for most companies, most of the time, acquisition is more important and more valuable. Um, in what we experience is that um, the concept of customer lifetime value on the acquisition side is relatively straightforward. There are essentially two things you can do. You can, once you classify your different customers, you can run lookalikes and similar audiences and bring similar people in who are um, almost as valuable, um, similarly valuable as the ones you already have. The second is if you... Let's just stop right there and just let's etch that in stone and kind of make that. That's, that's how marketing works. Full stop. I just wish more companies would just do that. Now let's see if you can go beyond that. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, there's a second piece you can do. You can extrapolate historical performance. You can see in your search campaigns, for example, in which areas you win the most loyal customers. And usually um, in the future, the behavior will be quite similar. So you can expect that in these areas, you continue winning the most loyal customers. And these are the two mechanisms you actually have to drive customer lifetime value. Mm -hmm. On the retention side, um, however, we feel that nobody knows what to do actually because you can um, do two things. You have your most valuable customers, and if you target them with ads, your performance will look amazing because they will all buy. Mm -hmm. The problem is they might be so loyal that they would have bought oh, anyway yeah. without seeing the ads. Right. And um, I haven't seen anyone out there who can now um, say what to do with that. Yeah. What would you recommend? How, so, so how to tackle things. this problem? Again, sometimes people hear what I'm saying and they get the wrong idea. Again, we don't have to spend a lot of attention development stuff. That's wrong. It's still important. Really, really, really important. You spend a little bit less on it, but let's spend smarter on it. So one of the things that I make a real big deal about uh, in, in, my, in my new book, the, the one more focused on implementation, is to look at all the different tactics that we use for retention and development. And let's be really careful about which one we use when. So as a specific example, loyalty programs. And there's so many companies out there that see loyalty programs as a panacea. It's going to fix the retention problems, it's going to fix the development problems, and it's going to work for everybody. Well, that's not really true, okay? And so we make a really big deal about this, that loyalty programs are great for the right customers at the right time. And specifically, in fact, I, I, I want to take a little straw poll over here, okay? Loyalty programs. Are they more about playing offense or playing defense? Are they more about you know, increasing value of an existing customers or getting to stay longer with you? Yeah, again, a well done loyalty program will accomplish a little bit of both, but which one should we be focusing on? So loyalty programs, more about offense? More about defense? Uh, back to school, people, back to school. <laughs> You know, if someone from, uh, from Mars comes to Earth and says, what is a loyalty program? <laughs> and, you know, if you had to describe it in the simplest possible terms, you'd say, buy nine, get one free. Right? Offense or defense? That's offense, right? We're trying to squeeze a little bit more value. And then, the, then it begs the question, who do, do we aim it at? High end? or the kind of the medium to low end. And my take on it is more about the medium to low end. It's these customers who aren't already locked into us, they could be buying a little bit more. So, so something like that, we have to be very careful about which tactics we're using when, and have much clearer expectations, not only about what their overall ROI is gonna be, but for which customers. So I spent a lot of time thinking about loyalty programs and premium services and strategic account management and a lot of the tools, CRM systems, uh, that we'd be using, focusing more on the kind of care and feeding of the existing customers and try to get companies just a little bit smarter about which one we should use when and broken record using lifetime value or changes in lifetime value to judge the effectiveness of it. So if we're a little bit more, you know, tactical about, uh, about the use of these programs, we would tend to see better results. We would tend to kind of get more out of fewer dollars and then take the rest of the dollars and spend them on smart acquisition. Uh -huh. uh, can we take some? Of course. There's another purpose of that is we, 
we're focusing on the value of our loyalty program for in-store identification. In-store identification allows us to see who our best customers are and what their in-store behavior is. So we actually use the loyalty program to guide our acquisition. That's a great point. That's a great, great point. That that uh, that there's that that second role of loyalty programs besides buy nine get one free, a chance to get people to self-identify, to willingly raise their hand and say, "I want my name and ID associated with these purchases." That is incredibly valuable. That there's there's no doubt about it. So, uh, so and and that's kind of a, a, a differential role. But even then, the the main purpose of it, the main target of it, would be. You know, the the so-so the customers who haven't self-identified before, whereas those ones who are part of the, the president's red carpet, blue ribbon, you know, club, uh, we kind of already know who they are. Uh, we want to give them incentives to self-identify, but it's not primarily aimed at them. All right. Um, we talked a lot about business applications, but there's also a practical side to it. In the end, you have to predict what the value of a customer is. And Mariana is the one um, handling um, this more difficult stuff um, at Creolytics. So um, I would throw the ball over to you to um, ask some more specific questions on this. Yes. Um, now that we understand the importance of customer lifetime value and we want to go into the modeling, in terms of data inputs and quality, do you believe companies should invest into acquiring more and more data or into build a reliable and accurate database in order to start predicting CLV? It really is about quality instead of, of quantity here. And so many companies come to me and they try to impress me with their data warehouse or their data lake or their data catalog, whatever noun you're putting after the word data. I don't know. I don't care. And I'm generally not impressed uh, because it's not necessarily the case that more is better. One of the real eureka moments for me occurred in the early 2000s when I realized how little data we need in order to calculate customer lifetime value properly. And, and that song hasn't changed since then. Uh, and so, so what are those, those three, I'll put you on the spot, what are the three metrics that we really obsess about? RFM, Recency, Frequency, Monetary Value. Uh, it's, it's really interesting that my, my wife used to work for, a, for an old direct marketing company, Franklin Mint, if you remember them. This is long before I kind of got the CLV bug myself. This is like early 1990s, before I even knew what CLV even stood for. Um, and she worked for the Mint, and they always, she'd always come back, RFM, RFM, RFM. They got it. They understood back to the 1970s that it's very hard for us to collect data, and so we've got to be really smart about what data we're going to look at. It's going to be very hard for us to calculate lifetime value. And so again, we need to, to do it as simply as possible. So for that, back then, they were doing it because of limitations. It was hard to get data. It was hard to do computation. Uh, but they recognized, because of, of, of the need to be smart, that RFM drove everything. If you give me recency, frequency, monetary value, I'll give you CLV. And I'm in that same place today. And when companies come to me and say, come on, we can get past that, can't we? Uh, sure, there are times when we do want to bring uh, other metrics in. There's no doubt about it. But a lot of the time, using nothing more than RFM and some relatively simple models, we can get 80 or 90 percent of the way there. Uh, and most companies need to walk before they run, before you try to leverage all of that data on where people are located in the social graph, or biometrics, or uses of social media, or neuro, whatever. Let's not even go there, okay? And again, I'm not being skeptical about that stuff. I'm saying let's first squeeze as much value as we can out of the really good data before we try to go to that next step. Yep, uh, I agree. And you went a little bit into my second question. It was like the difference between probabilistic and machine learning models. Do you believe that uh, we companies can still uh, have value out of each model? And yeah, it's a approach? very, very, very important point. Thank you for giving me the chance to raise it. Lots of different tools out there. The problem is, for most people, the, the, the one thing you hear about all the time, all the time, all the time is machine learning. Uh, and I don't even care which flavor of it you're talking about. If it's recurrent neural networks or TensorFlow, this or that, or base, what, whatever. Regression on steroids, okay? as opposed to the models that we're using that are more actuarial, the more probabilistic. We're not worried about bringing in all these explanatory factors until we really need to do so. So how do they stack up with each other? It's actually pretty simple. You, you need both. It depends on the question you're asking. So if the question is something about some kind of classification, will this customer churn in the next period or not? 
Um, you know, is this a good customer or not? If, it, if it's a question that can be answered by knowing what bucket someone's in, the machine learning approaches are the best. You can't do better than them. So that's why they're still a really, really vital part of the toolkit. But, and by the way, a lot of questions can be bucketized. <laughs> and what a lot of companies do is because that's all they know how to ask. All they think about is every business problem and figure out how can we ask this in a buckety kind of way. <laughs> but if your question has more of a longitudinal flavor to it, how long will this customer stay with us? Not will they churn in the next period or not, but how long will they stay with us? Right? They're very similar kinds of questions. But if you're more interested in the latter than the former, how many purchases will this person make? Not will they make a lot or a few. Um, uh, if you're asking those kinds of longer term questions, and by the way, you really want answers at a granular level, um, then the probabilistic models, the actuarial type models, will actually tend to be better. So you kind of need both. You really do need both. Um, but I, I just want people to think about what's the question we're really asking here? Let's not reframe it just because we happen to have a tool to answer it. Let's ask it the way that our, that our, our, our business demands and, and then use the right tools to answer it. And um, one of my current uh, projects at Creolytics is predicting uh, DCLV right after the first purchase. Do you believe it's feasible and like what is the advice on this? This is a, this is a really good question. <laughs> what we call, and maybe some of you call, the cold start problem. Someone just made their first purchase with us and we want to project their CLV. How do we do that? So what we were doing at Zodiac, which worked, Pretty well, could be better, honestly, was what we would do is, so, so we just acquired this new customer. We don't know much about her. All we have is this one purchase. We don't have enough to do a whole RFM analysis. So how are we going to come up with overall CLV? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to come with the CLV for every one of our existing customers. And then we're going to ask ourselves, how similar is each customer to her based on acquisition characteristics or pre-acquisition characteristics. So based on what kind of purchase you, you made, how much you spent, uh, different things about how we acquired you through the funnel, and then use machine learning approach, supervised learning, to basically say how similar are each of you to her, take the weighted average across your CLVs and say, that's her CLV. That's what we did, that's not bad. But my granddaughter, Ava Escarza, has a way, way cooler way to do this. And, and by the way, I'm not that old, okay? Um, she is my, one of my PhD students, PhD student, and she's a professor up at Harvard. And she, with one of her PhD students, has a brand new paper, not even published yet, exactly on this issue. And the spirit of it is very similar to what I just described, using characteristics of the acquisition purchase and the acquisition process to help us better understand uh, lifetime value. But the overall statistical approach, and I won't bore you with the details, is way, way, way better. So this is actually a true leading edge problem. Uh, it's really interesting academically, and of course it's super important commercially. So again, there's still lots of room for us to learn and improve and to collaborate on this kind of thing. So there's more coming on that one. I'm glad. <laughs> I know we read the paper. Um, Sometimes when working with retail data where the, the uh, purchase frequency is quite low, uh, it, I have a hard time to differentiate between the customers that are in between purchase and the customers that have churn. Uh, what is your advice on dealing with this problem? And, and that's where these kinds of models really shine. As I mentioned, um, I kind of um, stole, borrowed the models from a couple of other researchers who first came, first invented some of these models back in the mid-1980s, like 500 years ago. Um, and actually, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. The, the guy who first came up with this model, a gentleman named Don Morrison, he's a recently retired professor at UCLA, he actually came up with this model while sitting in church. Okay? And he was looking at some empty pews, and he was saying, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Smith usually sit over there, but they haven't been around for a while. I wonder if they're gone or if, you know, if they're just on vacation. Mr. and Mrs. Jones, you know, they haven't been a while, around for a while either, but they didn't come as often. So, you know, so it really was the same issue about looking at a hiatus since the last purchase and saying, is the customer just taking a snooze between purchases or are they gone? I mean, that's a fundamental question. And these probabilistic models answer that superbly well. I mean, really, really, really well to understand, you know, is the customer alive or dead? Uh, and by the way, 
we'll take these same approaches. For instance, I recently worked with a couple of physicians uh, at, the, the, at the Children's Hospital, University of Pennsylvania, to use the same model to address pediatric asthma. What? So, you know, little kids have little narrow windpipes. Some of them will grow out of it and won't be chronic asthmatic. Others will be chronic asthmatic. So can we look at your prescriptions of some kind of inhaler and project whether you've grown out of it or whether you're going, it's just a matter of time until you get your next prescription. And it works beautifully well. So there's actually a lot of circumstances, whether it's asthma, whether it's church, whether it's purchasing, um, where we can really sort out people who are still doing it, just got to wait a little bit longer, versus those who are done. And our ability to do that can really help address a lot of really important business problems and let us allocate resources more appropriately. Great. Mariana, um, we have time for one more question, and then um, we allow our audience to ask questions, if you have one more. Uh, sure. Um, I was interested in um, the different settings between subscriptions uh, modeling and non-subscription modeling. Um, how can we differentiate uh, the, each business setting? Well, the first, the first thing is we have to differentiate. Uh, and there's too many companies that don't make that important distinction. To me, that is the single most important distinction. Uh, that is the, the dichotomy that splits businesses into two buckets. It's not B2C versus B2B. It's not product or service. It's not high involvement items versus low involvement. Patterns there are all the same. It's subscription versus non-subscription. So it's really important that we use different language, that we use different metrics, that we use different models, that we use different managerial approaches, whether we're in a subscription setting or not. So for instance, let me get specific about it. In the subscription setting, we can use words like retention rate. We can say, of all the customers who were with us through the last period, how many of them renewed their subscription? Retention rate. It makes total sense. But in a non-subscription setting, that concept means nothing. It goes back to the point we were just talking about. Just because they didn't make a purchase with you doesn't mean they're dead. So you, there's no such thing as a retention rate. You can't measure or observe a retention rate in a non-subscription setting. So we really do need to use, again, different language, different metrics, different analytics, different models, different business processes for both. Uh, and of course, there's some subtleties there and some businesses, many businesses these days that cross over, that have some elements of each. So there's still lots of complications. But, but understanding that cut uh, and then, again, doing things properly in one versus the other, that's job one. Thank you. All right, um, this was it from our side, but I'm sure that we will have questions in the audience. So, who wants to know something from Peter? Please. Should I just ask? So you mentioned, you were talking about in the very beginning about your work with P, P firms, and you mentioned something like cohorts are getting worse. What do you mean by that? Before, say again? You said cohorts are, uh, like about... Ah, the cohort analysis. Cohorts are getting worse. What do you mean by yeah, that? Yeah, so if, if you think about it, um, for, for most companies, that first bunch of customers you acquire, let's say when you start business or you move into a new geographic area or you launch a new product, they're going to be awesome, right? Those are going to be the customers who are lining up around the block to buy your stuff. And the next cohort is going to be generally not quite as good. And they're going to, so generally, for most companies, there's going to be this slow but steady degradation as we go from the customers you acquire in Q1 to Q2 to Q3 to Q4. Uh, I'm not saying it happens all the time. It's not a universal rule. But you should anticipate that slight worsening of customers over time. And so if we look at the customers we've acquired and think, well, that's an indication of how good our future customers are going to be, you're going to be disappointed and someone's going to get fired. So it's important to, to look for and then anticipate and, and actually predict what that next cohort's going to look like collectively before we even acquire them. And that's real, and I'm not saying it's easy, but it's important to at least try to do that. And it's actually remarkable, I don't want to again, not saying universally, but for a company that's reasonably well established and how regular that drop off might be, um, and that can be really valuable um, to kind of see changes before they even happen. By the way, let me say one other thing about cohorts. Um, let's talk about competition. Isn't it great that we spend all, all this time talking about marketing this and that? No one said anything about competition. I like that. 
Uh, it turns out that competition doesn't matter nearly as much as you think it does. We obsess about competition for the same reason we used to obsess about demographics in the old days, because it was so visible. We had nothing else to look at. So how does competition hurt us? Turns out that when you look at, an ex at your existing customers and your competitors just launched a new thing, it doesn't impact them nearly as much as you think it does. Because what happens with the existing customers, a shakeout occurs that the customers who are like, eh, will eventually leave. It's those loyal, locked-in ones who are going to buy you forever, and they don't really care about the competitive thing. But where competition hurts you is on the, the, the new cohorts. And so sometimes you'll see this big drop, boom, in that next group, in the quality and quantity of customers that we acquire. That's a sign that there's something happening externally that's kind of taking, taking us off of our rhythm. So very often when we, when we want to see the impact of competition, it's going to be through these changes in cohort quality or vice versa. When we see big changes in cohort quality, there's something going on out there in the marketplace. And if we look at our customer base as a whole, we might not see it because that new, customer, new cohort is, is tiny compared to our old cohorts. Um, so it's important to look at them as kind of an early warning sign about what your next cohorts are going to look like and what your fate might be. So the cross cohort analyses are vital for all kinds of reasons. And a lot of companies are starting to wake up and do them more regularly, um, but it's, it, it, that's not just like a nice to know, it's essential. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is just kind of building on your question. To what extent is the cohort issue actually a channel um, specific issue? So like a lot of director consumer brands, obviously they get to a point where they're spending really um, like significant capital to acquire new customers and then they you know, pivot and open a physical retail location and then they're able to, for some reason, tap into a different type of customer that is that they can acquire at a lower cost. Absolutely. So, That's a great question. Um, so first of all, when we do our cohort analysis, we definitely want to take that into account. In fact, in many cases, we're not only going to look at time-based cohorts. You know, going back to the cold start problem, um, what we're going to do is look at all kinds of acquisition characteristics. Which channel did we acquire you through? What's the first product category you bought from us? What kind of campaign did you respond to? So we want to break things down on lots of different dimensions, not only time. And sometimes we will see bigger, more interesting dynamics by being mindful of those things than the mere passage of time. So, so number one, you're absolutely right, and, and we have to look beyond time. But having said that, time is going to be the, the kind of the first main characteristic. Um, I mentioned that it's not a universal rule that cohorts get worse over time. And very often, it's that channel reason why we'll sometimes see improvements in cohorts. Very often, what we'll see is as we move from being just a pure digitally native business, and we open up our first store, um, we're going to see like just pure awesomeness that we're going to tap into all kinds of good customers who either weren't aware of us before or they were skeptical to buy online or, or whatever reason. And again, th those customers themselves will degrade over time. But for a while, that kind of just influx of, of goodness um, will make our overall cohorts look better and better and better for a while. So, it's, it's, so, so that's, that, that, that's great. It, it, it's almost magic. And if we didn't take into account those, those channel dynamics, we would give ourselves too much credit. We would say, you know what? The customer is connecting with our message and our product and our story. And we'll kind of pat ourselves on the back and think we're doing something right when it's actually some, not to say that opening stores is wrong, right. but there's kind of a, an, another reason for it. So that, that, that's a really great point. <coughs> We're about to embark on some primary research around segmentation. And actually, we were talking to P, P and G, and they said they have moved away from segmentation research, and they've do, they're doing more needs-based primary research now. So how does some of this work, which is primarily quantitative? Mm -hmm. so, what is your opinion on how that should blend in with traditional you know, primary research? Ah, OK. Excellent, excellent question. So that's actually, uh, I, uh, I thought you were going somewhere and you, you kind of took a turn in an interesting direction. <laughs> so I'll tell you. So we could talk about the personas and all that stuff. I'll get back to that. I'm happy to talk about it. But let's talk about needs-based research. Look, I'm going to admit my bias. I'm a behavioral kind of guy, okay? I'm saying actions speak louder than words. You know, show me the money. So I find that just, you know, looking purely at behavior, Recency, frequency, monetary value gets me really, 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 really far. Uh, and until I really 
master, until I really squeeze all the value and insight out of simple, observable behavior, I'm not going to go any further than that. But, number one, once we have squeezed all that value out, where do we go next? Do we turn to needs? Do we turn to the social graph? Do we turn to, you know, bioinformatics? Uh, and to, to P&G's point, I would say kind of the, the, the second best kind of data to bring in would be attitudinal data. Needs, wants, frustrations, benefits sought. Um, and point number two, if you're in a setting like a packaged goods company and it's hard to do the tagging and tracking, it's hard to get the RFM data, then you might have no choice but to turn to, you know, uh, data set number two, which would be more attitudinal data. So, so I have nothing against that. I think that, that that's great. For, for many companies, I don't want to see that preempt the behavioral data if the behavioral data is at your fingertips. But again, once you exhaust its goodness or if you can't collect a lot of it, then turning to attitudinal data will, will, will be the next best thing. Do you think the answer to that question is different for a luxury company like this where a lot of our creative and our advertising influences and changes your needs and wants? Because fundamentally, we're not a need. Luxury products are not. Right, and that's, why I, and that's why I broadened it out from needs alone to needs and wants <laughs> and benefits and frustrations. So to me, again, I'm a behavioral guy, so I'm going to look at a lot of attitudinal data and, and you know, sort of unfairly just lump it all together. <laughs> um, it's not all that unfair, though. Um, so yeah, that, those are all different types of, of attitudinal data. But I'm going to contend very, very strongly that even for a, a luxury goods company, it's all about RFM. It's all about behavior. It's all the, the heterogeneity distribution is going to look exactly the same for Tiffany as it's going to look for Foot Locker. Now, the scale on the x-axis might be a little bit different. The numbers might be a little bit bigger in your case, but the shape of that graph is, is going to look quite the same. So first, you want to look at all that behavioral data and, and either you know tell me I'm right or convince me I'm wrong about that and then start to layer in some of the attitudinal stuff to understand, so we got that big spike of valuable customers on the right. What makes them different? And a leading issue over there is gonna be needs and wants and benefits and frustrations. And once we find out that, oh my goodness, those customers who love us, who will go through the gates of hell to stay with us, have a very different set of needs and wants than everybody else, then we can start to play the persona game. Then we can start to, to say, how do we acquire more customers who you know, seem to, have, to, 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 to march by, by the same beat? And, and that's, that's great. That's terrific. I'm all for that. We just don't want to start with it. We want to start with the lifetime values and then bring that stuff in you know, to, to really understand the differences in the CLVs. Make sense?